dashboards have dominated the analytics industry for years, serving as the key touch point between analysts and data. But is that now changing as many companies embed analytics directly into their operational systems? Not so fast, Vizzy. Dashboards are here to stay. The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh here, folks, and what an all-star cast we have today for our show. We're going to be hearing from my good buddy, Sean Rogers of TIBCO, my longtime colleague and visionary, Jen Stirrup, is on the line, dialing in from across the pond, and Miles Gilsonen as well from Proficient, all three proficient in data and data visualization. And the topic for today, and I promise, folks, this headline was not link bait. <laughs> okay, I promise it wasn't link bait. I just couldn't help myself. It's the decline of dashboards, not so fast, busy. And I'm basically joking about something that I saw on some website somewhere. And I was researching for this show and I saw some comment about the decline of dashboards. I'm like, the decline of dashboards? What on earth were they talking about? So I looked it up and I'm pretty sure it's what we call a vendor speak or vendor messaging. You see this all the time and it's basically the nexus of technology, marketing, management, concepts and the desire to sell stuff basically or just grab attention right a lot of folks don't realize that uh, in the marketing world especially for something like enterprise software you have multiple stages first you have to get someone's attention then you have to give them something that's interesting to, to learn about or to read about then you have to nurture that lead then hopefully a salesperson who's competent calls them and sells them something then of course you have to deliver the software and then maintain the software and then keep them happy etc so it's a very long cycle with lots of different steps but that that whole part about just getting attention is really important because there's so much noise out there and there's a lot of signal too it's not just noise there's so much commentary there's so many press releases and so, so many uh, white papers and articles and all kinds of things. And it's called content, right? And it's funny because I remember way back in 2000 and what, three, when I relaunched Mobius Media, which is a PR firm I started in New Orleans a long time ago, I threw out this concept called content-oriented marketing. And the idea was that if you are in a business like business intelligence and data warehousing, et cetera, if you're a consultant, you can't just come up with a slick brochure and send it out there. You have to demonstrate to the world what your knowledge is and you use that content to, as your marketing, as your advertising to get people to listen to you. So that's what we do these days. Now content marketing is everywhere. It's this huge thing. Everybody does it. You can do retargeting, all kind of stuff. But that's what fuels a lot of the social media in our space. It's what fuels all the marketing efforts is all this content. Well, so anyway, I saw a decline of dashboards. I'm like, all right, this is, uh, you guys are killing me here. And I looked into it and I'm pretty sure it was just vendor speak because dashboards are not going away. Dashboards are never, ever, ever, ever going to go away. But they are changing. And I think they're changing in some really compelling ways. So very quickly before I bring in Sean Rogers, I'll just say that uh, so what, two years ago, I did a, a keynote at the Data Vault conference, uh, which was great. Dan Lentz that invited me. It was a lot of fun. And I was charged with talking about AI versus data warehousing and will one supplant the other? What's going to happen? And my conclusion was that AI and data warehousing are a fantastic complement. They're a cohort, basically. And what you want to do is use data warehousing still for your real hard truth, your hardened truths, what you really need to know, the numbers that have to be proven and accurate and auditable, et cetera. But then you want to use AI as the other side of that picture to surface things that you may not have noticed because AI is very good at that kind of thing. It's very good at just kind of crawling around data sets and surfacing something that looks interesting. And then you use the two of them. And my concept was that it's like the left eye and the right eye. If you have two eyes, you can have depth perception. If you only have one eye, you lose depth perception because you don't have the extra eye. You can't triangulate things basically. And so I said that if you get AI and data warehousing as two sides of your dashboard of your worldview, you'll be able to get depth perception and really understand not just what's happening, but what's probably going to happen, what did happen and beyond. So with that, I'm going to throw it over to Sean Rogers of TIBCO to tell us a bit about his views on dashboards and where things are going in this burgeoning industry. Sean, take it away. Well, you know, I'll comment first on the title like you were at uh, 
it reminded me of uh, everybody running around a few years back screaming that Hadoop will replace everything. Um, <laughs> it, these declarative yeah. statements show up in our industry all the time. And, and, and Hadoop funny. has found a great place in a lot of ecosystems that are supportive of analytics and data management and everything else. And I think everything kind of finds a space, but it, I, used to, I used to talk about those declarative things and, and going back to our title today, it's like having a bad case of bright, shiny toy syndrome. You know, you get distracted by the newest thing and, and saying something like a particular type of uh, concept or solution is dead. Um, it reminds me of my days as an analyst when someone would tell me on a phone call that we're the first or we're the only and we don't have competition. And I would always scratch my head and think, ooh, boy, I'm not sure if you understand what's happening. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea of dashboards, data visualization is actually, from our perspective and mine personally, is growing in leaps and bounds. I mean, you kind of see this convergence, almost like a hyper convergence around everything that's happening about delivering information and helping companies and businesses make decisions in new and powerful ways. Um, you know, I've seen some really fun things happen over the last few years. There's a kind of a cool convergence of where uh, data science and predictive insights are now meeting dashboards and meeting those users and extending their capabilities beyond uh, what they might have done with a dashboard or a data visualization a couple of years ago. You also see things like real time uh, finding its way into these platforms and automated decisioning. So for me, um, I, I joked with you before the session started, and I think a couple of days ago when we talked, and I said, I read the title, I almost called you and told you I wasn't coming. Um, but, and, and, and I read the second part and went, okay, fine, I'll, I'll have that conversation with you. But uh, yeah, I think it's an exciting time for what we've often called dashboards or data visualization tools. I think there's a, an incredible convergence of new capabilities and a lot of that's brought on by the fact, uh, Eric, that we have access to a whole lot more data than we used to. All the data in the enterprise is really kind of at our fingertips in a way that it wasn't prior. And you can thank things like Hadoop and data lakes and, and new architectures for helping bring that to, to being. So I, I don't think you can innovate at the data layer without innovating at the dashboard data visualization layer. And also meeting, I think Miles said it uh, earlier and, and we'll hear from him on today's call uh, about this idea of the community of users has proliferated in a way that I don't think any of us expected. We serve a much wider community with data visualization today than we did 15 years ago. So yeah, I, I, I think it's anything but that. I think it's a cornerstone of innovation for most of our customers and for, for most folks trying to leverage data to make decisions. Yeah, and I think the key really is that da dashboards have to evolve and they need what we always wanted them to have, but now they can have it, which is the ability to drill down, to go from the high level view layer by layer down to the granular data to really understand what's happening. And you want them to be much more dynamic. You don't want them to be so static. But to me, a dashboard is always going to be a major lens through which any executive or even line operating per business person views the world. And you have to design it properly and you have to maintain it properly. You don't want it to be too busy, but you sure do want to follow your key metrics. And, and to me, one of the keys to success is going to be dynamic nature, meaning it's going to notice something that you should be looking at and haven't been. It'll show you the stuff that you've, you've programmed it to, but you want to have some other side of that picture, which just services strange things that are happening, because that's where rubber meets road to me is where you get something new and something different. What do you think, Sean? Well, I, you know, I think the time to decision or the time to action is becoming much more critical. Um, things like streaming, as I mentioned, or real-time decisioning is extremely important. If you don't have the ability to look at data, not just through a rear view mirror, which a lot of dashboards and data visualizations are quite good at doing, you need to be able to look at the data in real time. And the closer to the real time moment that a decision can be made, oftentimes the more profitable, the more valuable, uh, the more intimate with your customer, all of those things have great value. And when the gaps get too big, you know, the, you know, the, the common example is, I had, a, I had a customer, they were on my website, they're a great candidate for a new mortgage. 
unfortunately, I figured that out by looking at some historical data in a dashboard. Um, that's no fun and it's not valuable. But if you have, uh, I guess, a, an up-to-date or a, a powerful dashboard and data visualization system, you can mix historical, prescriptive and predictive along with streaming insights. And, and that's what I meant by this sort of hyper convergence of cool things that are happening around this type of technology. They're, they're anything but extinct. They're really becoming even more powerful within most companies. Let's bring in Jen Stirrup, long time data visionary. Jen, I've watched your work for a long, long time. Thanks to social media, I get to stay on top of what you're doing, where you're going. And you've been working with clients and vendors and really the whole gamut, analysts, everyone. So you've got a nice purview of this subject area. And we were joking in the pre-call about how sometimes you still have to educate people about the basics like mean versus median. But maybe tell us what are your thoughts on the evolution of dashboards and where this whole space is going? So I think the evolution of dashboards has been some great technical innovations. I love the fact that it's so much easier now than it used to be for organizations to create dashboards. For me personally, that's a huge advancement. I'm keen that people are really empowered with their data and allowing them to create dashboards really simply and easily is a great first step with that. But I will say that with dashboards, they sometimes throw up some of the difficulties in an organization. They don't always understand what the key metrics are. Sometimes you see power struggles as well, because people don't always understand the data and that can make them go in the back foot a little bit. They feel a bit exposed because we do talk about being data driven. But actually, I'm not sure we are totally data driven. We bring ourselves to it. So I think I prefer the term insights inspired. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you're using the data, but you're also bringing yourself to it and your organization and your objectives. And I love the technology is making that easier. I still think there is an evolution that needs to happen. We're not there yet. We still spend a lot of time trying to work out the business processes. So when I saw the title for this, I thought the decline of dashboards and I thought, well, in some ways in industry, perhaps that's our own fault because we haven't given people enough best practices. And that's mm -hmm. something I like to talk about in my blog. So regardless of the technology in a way, because you can find those best practices. But I think we have to be sympathetic and empathetic as well. I think empathy is such an important tool and uh, it's what we can bring to the table. When we talk to people about their dashboards, understand what do they really want? Because what customers want and what they need are two different things. <laughs> and what they ask for sometimes is very different from what they actually mean. So it's never as straightforward as click, click, click. I wish it was. And I would love to see i think more best practices i think technology is fantastic in making dashboards more simple but that doesn't mean it's the right answer to the right questions and we're not very good at asking ourselves the right questions i think i don't know what the rest of the team think yeah that's a really good point and you know you kind of just reference what i've been thinking about and commented on earlier when you say people don't always ask for what they really want and it's 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 also not necessarily because they don't know the business. I think a lot of times people underestimate the critical importance of context, even in basic communication. And a lot of folks presume that the person you're talking to knows where you're coming from, knows what you're going to say. I mean, if that were the case, why even have the conversation, right? So th there is something to be said for offering up new ideas. And I do, I'm very hopeful about some changes in corporate culture that I'm seeing where you're seeing some additional focus on what they refer to in, in some circles as sort of uh, psychological encouragement or uh, giving people the, the feeling that they can speak up their minds, speak of their mind and not be criticized or shut down or, or whatever. And I think that data has a big part to play in that because all of a sudden we can all see the data, right? And, and the ability to sort of slow that down or throttle access to data, which was a very old tactic that's been used, you know, probably since the, the year 5000 BC, if you get right down to brass tacks. I think that's kind of going away, but we're still in this sort of 
fluid state in between the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. And data is a big part of that because now we can all see the data, even with sort of external, what they call third party or alternative data in the outside world. If you can, you can see this everywhere now, you can see it in Google searches, you can look things up and like, oh, so the industry average is this and we're here, well, why is that? That helps you start asking questions <clears throat> and really the dashboard should be like the launching pad for exploration of what's happening in your business, right, Jen? Yes, that's right. And I'll just pick up on something Sean said earlier. It's that lovely phrase, time to action. And I think our dashboards should give you that, but they should also give you time to next question. They asks you and helps you to, uh, prompts you to think of the next question after you've been given an action. So once you realize something, what do you do next? And how can you push that forward? And I think that's difficult sometimes for people. They don't always see the way forward. I remember speaking to one customer who just said, oh, the data will tell me everything. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't need my business analysts anymore. I've got the data. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I can't tell you how much I threw my hands up in horror to say, no, you absolutely need the interpretation of the data. So time to action, time to answer is very important, but so is that time to question, time to next question as well. Next up, we have Miles Gilsonen, who is with Proficient these days, and uh, he's also a data warehousing expert, knows a lot about data visualization. Miles, tell us a bit about yourself and where you see us in the evolution of dashboards for analytics. Sure, uh, Eric, well, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, I'm with Proficient, I run the analytics business, uh, analytics practice for our Oracle business unit. And, uh, you know, I too was taken aback by the title a little bit. Uh, you know, I kind of thought to myself, if, if dashboards are declining, <laughs> somebody should have told every major news outlet, every, everybody who ever said anything about COVID had a dashboard. <laughs> That's right. And uh, frankly, some of them were pretty good. As a guy that does it for a living, I got some great information and, and they, the visuals got better. Uh, but the thing about, uh, dashboards, you're, you're never going to be bringing together data across multiple different domains as long as you can trust it. At a glance, people have short attention spans now. If it's trusted data, you're not going to be able to beat it. But dashboards these days need to be part of a broader data ecosystem. It can't just be a one-stop shop. We have people now, if you're a 40-year-old executive, then you've been working with data, you've been on the internet, you have a, a way of dealing with data. You can't be given a static dashboard with five filters on it and think that that person's going to be okay necessarily. Uh, so you have to know the audience and you have to kind of give it the right context. Okay, these are some trusted metrics. These you, uh, these you can drill down on. This other platform over here, you can explore, you can do data visualizations. So we've found working with our customers, if we can paint a broader picture and really understand the audience, some people are fine with just the five or six filters. I got what I need. Then there's other people. They really want to get behind that data. So I think, I think dashboards, you're, you're never going to replace an at a glance view. And one of the things I like is the nexus with AI. I think a couple of people mentioned it uh, and the cloud really enables that. It's so different than on-prem because you can have, if you're on a cloud platform, you can be running machine learning against your data and it can suggest to you things that you were not looking at. So, you know, everyone talked about what questions should you be asking? And the thing is, we don't know what we don't know. So we're not asking questions. We're going to have blind spots and a dashboard doesn't necessarily uncover a blind spot for you. There can be kind of a bias loop there where you're not really getting the insight that you should machine learning and AI. Uh, can kind of help with that. You know, it can open open things up a little bit and suggest to you in a proactive manner, hey, why don't you take a look at this? This is an anomaly. Revenue has spiked down or inventory uh, has, uh, is not where it should be, those kind of things. So we're, we're, we're very excited about dashboarding uh, and its companion, you can't separate dashboarding from visualizations. And right. the visualizations have gotten better. Now we're, we've got maps all over the place. You could create visualizations uh, of a floor. You could take a factory floor and visualize that and just click on and, and see inventory and uh, how things are going on the factory floor. And these are kind of, I would say, standard capabilities in, in almost all of the uh, packages. So I think we, we've got a bright future, we think, for, uh, 
for dashboards. Talking with three industry visionaries, folks, very excited today. Sean Rogers from Tibco, Jen Stirrup from Data Relish, and Miles Gilsonen from Perficient. And we have several good questions from the audience, from our live studio audience. And if you're driving around listening to the show, you too could be part of the live studio audience. Just hop online to dmradio.biz and you can actually sign up. We record the shows via Zoom these days, so you can watch us in action, just like Howard Stern, but uh, less profane. Uh, so I'm going to give one of these questions to each of our guests. Uh, Sean, I'll throw this one over to you. One of the attendees was asking, how do you avoid oversimplifying elements of a dashboard to the point where an executive may miss something really important? Um, you know, I, you said one of the words earlier today that always piques my interest, which is storytelling. Um, and, and I think you have to avoid uh, these very flat sort of non-engageable dashboards. Um, <laughs> a lot of people still produce them. Um, and I, I, we were joking as we went to break because Jen was giving a great example of some of the trials and tribulations of getting things right. And I, I made the comment that, oh my gosh, that's a great dashboard. And then usually the executive follows up with, do you know what would really be cool? And, and, and the best executives will ask that next level question and you've got to you have to have a kind of a process in place to help them if you just zap a flat dashboard at people i think you're missing the bigger opportunity for business understanding and the single types of dashboards to me aren't nearly as interesting that's where we started but you know miles has made some great comments about you know infused ai and ml in dashboards helping you identify things the things that you don't know you don't know uh to use his words and and i think all of that's real critical so you you have to avoid it by best practices you have to push your executives not to settle for the simple flat things uh and i think it also makes a lot of sense oftentimes with executives depending on the use case um, the integration of a storyteller or an analyst with dashboards is often a really great way to get the job done. I think that's why so many companies are looking at analytic centers of excellence right now, because it brings that village of people that are around the data and around the insight together as a resource for the entire enterprise. And I think it helps you avoid those things. So, you know, that's yeah. my view. That's good advice. That's good advice. And I'll throw this next one over to Jen. An attendee is writing in, I don't see a lot of people looking at their dashboards continuously, especially among the teams that have thousands of them. How do you get people to react to dashboards? And I think one of the cool things about today's world with the modern technology we've talked about is you can track all this stuff. You can see who's using which tool, when, at what time, for how long. You can see where the conglomeration is for this dashboard or that dashboard. And you can also see what they're not looking at. So it's really, it's a management process, right? From someone who is engaged in watching what people watch. What do you think, Jen? I think if people are not looking at the dashboards, it's because you're not showing them data that interests them or data that's relevant. I think we always assume that more data is a good thing because we're data people. We have more data, so that's good. And actually, it's about the right data sometimes. And I know that that's not always a very popular opinion because we talk about big data. More data is better. We want someone to store our big data. I know Sean mentioned earlier about the sort of magpie syndrome. We get very attracted by shiny technology. And that's great. But I think what's really hard is identifying those business questions that really identify and will add real value. So if people are not using the dashboards, then you're not showing them the right data. And that's not a problem with the tool. It could be any tool, actually. It's um, more the process. Find out what they're doing and look out up. Look out for shadow IT and look out for shadow data sources, because I bet you they're there. They're just not showing them to you and you will be trying to prize them out of the cold's dead fingers because it will never let them go <laughs> <laughs> that's and i will say this i love shadow it there are some interesting new technologies out there and some methodologies discussed i'll throw this over to miles for i wouldn't say encouraging shadow it but just a, not discouraging it so overtly 
And typically, think about the sort of balance between business and IT that we've seen over many, many years now. The business was in charge, then IT was in charge, then they're kind of fighting and you hide things. I think that those days are ending. I think it's partially because of DevOps, because we have developers kind of step into the mix, but also you're just not going to survive if you have people hiding things from you. And we did a question from an audience member about the forensic role for dashboarding on top of any sort of real-time systems. And I think it is important to be very transparent. Like when you change the rule for how you count something, that's a really big deal. And that needs to be communicated. And to me, if you have the right culture, that's what's gonna happen. You're not gonna have people changing the rules to make it look good, because that's happened many, many, many times. Just make it look good, get through the board meeting and go back to our three hour cocktail lunches. You know, you can't do that stuff anymore. But Miles, what do you think about that? The importance of transparency, especially around rules and metrics and how they're designed and calculated. Oh, it's, it's taken on so much importance. By the way, I have to mention that I'm, I'm a proud alumnus of Shadow IT. So I, I, I graduated 20 <laughs> years ago, created a profitability system in a big bank. Every year, IT tried to defund it. Wow. But, but the business uh, loved it, so it got funded. Uh, and that was, uh, that was 20 years ago. And thank goodness, because that was my job. Um, but transparency couldn't, couldn't be more important. Every dashboard is the result of an assembly line, of an, a data assembly line. And I know that's kind of obvious to say, but for many years, analytics has had its own last mile problem. And that is the data that really matters, the people whose jobs are on the line, if that data is wrong, want to touch that data and they want to cleanse that data and they want to give that data context. <laughs> and they want to put comments next to that data. Understand that this does not include the XYZ region and that we had to take a hit here because of uh, an accounting rule and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the trust in the data is intimately linked with the explainability of the data. So I would say the good thing is that the vendors are aware of this and the AI revolution, if I can say that, uh, made it really clear that you have to be able to explain how you came to those recommendations or those results. So explainable AI is a big trend. Some of the vendors now are trying to build into their platforms explanations of how they arrived at the conclusion, even if it's AI. Uh, and some of, the, uh, some of the other vendors are uh, building in capabilities to explain what happened during the creation of this dashboard. This was excluded, this was included. Here is the calculation. And I don't think that's going to go away. I think in order to have the trust, you're going to have to have people that can understand it. And I just wanna say, I really like the comment on the Analytics Center of Excellence. I uh, built one in, in a company where I was. Uh, and you do, it's a great way to take the capability, the people that know the data, that know the platform, that know the ins and outs of how the data flows through and how the rules are applied to the data and leverage whatever platform you're using and bringing that skill set to solving data problems so that you can kind of get beyond the last mile problem. The last mile problem is downloading to Excel and having you know three or four people scrub it so that they're comfortable when it goes to the big boss that it's not wrong. And I understand that if it was my job, I might want to do that too but it's, it's inefficient and we're moving more towards real time and you, you don't have time for that. So, so the transparency couldn't be more important. And I think the industry is starting to turn that direction. Yeah, and I'll throw it over to, to Sean to comment on that. I saw you smiling. Oh, you know, it just, you know, we're in terrible agreement, right? And, you know, the, the way I would articulate it is, is it's, it's not always the technology. Oftentimes it's the diversity of the group that is centric to our data and our decisioning. And that's what Miles, I think, and I are both chatting about on, on this whole idea of a center of excellence. If you have all the right people in the room, you get the right insights, you avoid the flat and terrible dashboards, you have the SMEs in the room that understand how the business is doing things with this data. I think there's there's an awful lot to it. And, and you just mentioned transparency as well. And that's also part of it. And then that goes back to what I was saying before, right? You have fragmentation, you have inconsistencies and you have trust issues. I think that that's partially what we get. Uh, we can help eliminate, not just with technology, but also with the right people in the room too. So yeah, I'm just uh, violently agreeing with Maya.
Yeah, this has been a fantastic show, folks. We're coming up on the end of a live version. If you want to be on DM Radio, send me an email, info at dmradio.biz. You are listening to DM Radio.